Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Dural Anglican Online. I'm Dougal, Senior Minister. I'm really pleased you can be with us as we return to our series from 1 Thessalonians. We've come together as the Church of God to fix our eyes on Jesus, to encourage one another, to hold fast to the hope that he's given us, and to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. To help us do that, please enjoy our first song. It's called The Lion and the Lamb. Tonya. 
I attend the evening service and sometimes the morning service at Dural. Today, we're going to continue reading Paul's letter to the church in Thessalonia. So grab your Bibles and let's look up the reading. Now, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. Living to please God. As for others matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. As in fact, you are living. Now we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that's holy and honourable, not in a passionate lust like the pagans who don't know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins. As we told you and warned you before, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now, about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you, in fact, have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do more and more and to make your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not depend on anybody. This is God's word. Well, a couple of weeks back, I read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 at the dinner table. Now, that's where we were up to, so that's what I read. It started out okay, but when we got to the bit about sex and self-control, I sensed the crowd was getting a bit embarrassed, but confident of the enduring relevance of God's word, I pushed on. Afterwards, one of my children said that uh, in future I might want to consider whether passages like this are appropriate for dinner time conversation. Oh, then in a comment that may well form the backbone of therapy sessions for years to come, I reminded my children without God's good gift of sex, they wouldn't be here. Possibly not my finest parenting moment, but I stand by it and here's why. We live in a time where sexual indulgence has been normalised, meaning not much has changed between first century Thessalonica and modern day Sydney. Two cities separated in time, but who share a notorious reputation for sexual decadence. But while sexual morality is the presenting issue for much of this passage, the main consideration here relates to a broader question. That is, what kind of life pleases God? What kind of living is appropriate for people professing faith in Jesus Christ? Brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. If you're just joining us here at Dural, we're working our way through a letter 
written by the Apostle Paul to a new Christian community in the city of Thessalonica. Till now, the purpose of the letter has been to encourage the Thessalonians. Suffering terrible persecution, Paul's first goal was to reassure these people to stand firm. But now the emphasis changes and the question of how to live as Jesus' people takes prominence. As John Stott puts it in his commentary, having shared the essence of the good news about Jesus, Paul now shares the essence of the good life, that is, the necessity of good works by which saving faith in Jesus is authenticated. Brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. We get to see that saving faith produces distinct lives that are pleasing to God. Saving faith produces distinct lives that are pleasing to God. But what does that summary mean? Well, let me explain. It's perhaps so obvious you'll think it's unnecessary, but I want to point out Paul writes this letter to Christians. When the Thessalonians were converted from false pagan religion to serve the living and true God, chapter 1, verse 9, they became, in that moment, present tense, acceptable to God by faith in the sin-bearing death of Jesus. Which means Paul is writing to God's forgiven people. That being so, he outlines how their lives must now change in response more and more, verse 1 reflecting their new status as God's forgiven people. Now, thankfully, by his Holy Spirit, God makes progressive life change possible. That's what's being described in these verses, the ongoing work of God's Spirit shaping us into the likeness of Jesus. After living to please themselves, now the Thessalonian Christians, and by extension we, are told how to live in order to please God. And all this gets very practical because for the person claiming to be a Christian, what comes next is not advice. These are instructions for life that pleases God. And they come to us, chapter 4, verse 2, with the authority of the Lord Jesus. So if God's Spirit is leading us to a changed life, in response to Jesus' forgiveness. What will a distinctive life that pleases God actually look like? Verse 3, it's God's will that you should be sanctified. We'll come back to that. That you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honourable. Not in passionate lust, verse 5, like the pagans, who don't know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. Our sexual relationships are the presenting issue here, but the goal you see in verse 3, God's will for you is your sanctification. But what does that mean? Well, to begin with, the words sanctification and holiness amount to much the same thing becoming more like Jesus, it would be my summary. Sanctification is Paul's way of describing the work of God's Spirit. When you become a Christian, God's Spirit sets about reshaping you so that your way of life begins to reflect Jesus' character more and more. That's the essence of what Paul is saying in verse 1. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that is, to live a life pleasing to God more and more. That's one reason the vision for our church is to see people being transformed by Jesus. And because this transformation is God's will for his people, Despite our failures, we can be optimistic that God will do his work in us. 
Fair enough, but why does Paul zero in on the sexual habits of the Thessalonians as the first issue of transformation to be addressed? Well, the following snapshot of Thessalonian culture gives us a clue. A man might have a mistress to provide companionship. The institution of slavery made it easy for him to have a concubine, a live-in sexual object while casual gratification was available from a harlot, that is, a prostitute. The function of his wife, what a lovely way to describe her, was to manage the household and to be the mother of his legitimate children. I hope you'd agree there's a lot wrong with that scenario. The simple point I would make is this behaviour was normal and accepted within the prevailing culture from which the Thessalonian Christians were converted. This is where they've come from. But having become Christians, chapter 2, verse 13, since the word of God is at work in those who believe, having received Jesus as saviour, now they must go about making Jesus Lord of their lives. For the Thessalonian Christians, their pagan sexual lifestyles are now totally inconsistent with their new identity as disciples of Jesus. And for us, living in a pornified culture where almost every version of sexual behaviour gets celebrated, a large part of our transformation, our sanctification, will involve avoiding similar kinds of sexual immorality. It would be naive to think we've not been influenced by the permissive hookup culture of our hyper-sexualised city. I should mention what's called sexual immorality here and in other passages. It's the translator's way of capturing one word referring to any and every form of sexual relationship outside the context of man-woman marriage. And even within that context, verse 6, the taking advantage of a partner through sexual abuse or selfishness, greed and so on, would likewise fit the category of immorality. Now, I'm aware limiting what's considered honourable sexual conduct to the context of man-woman marriage is, putting it mildly, unfashionable. It was unpopular in Thessalonica too. But fitting in with worldly culture has never been part of God's good, loving plan for his people. It's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. That being said, God remains 100% in favour of his people enjoying sexual relationships. Of course he does. He thought it up. Sex is part of his good creation, Genesis 1, through which, in the words of the marriage service in the prayer book, a husband and a wife express their natural instincts and affections. Sex is a good gift from our good God who wants the best for his children. But we don't live in a Genesis 1 world. We inhabit and in our own way contribute to this rebellious Genesis 3 world where every good gift from God, including human relationships in general and sex in particular, has been distorted by greed, lust, power, selfishness and more, and perhaps especially in our time, degraded through widespread consumption of pornography. To the point where, instead of sexual intimacy being reserved for the safe confines of the husband-wife relationship, in our wisdom we've descended together into all manner of sexual immorality. Some of us as victims, others as willing participants, quite possibly both. All of which drives us to Jesus. Some of us will need his restoration and healing for past abuse. Others, perhaps many of us, will need his strength to fight unwanted, ungodly sexual desire. All of us need the gift of his forgiveness. I'm sure these mixed feelings were present among the Thessalonian Christians when this letter was read. 
And I take it, at least in part, that's why Paul urges them to love one another, verse 10, more and more. Because we don't need a Christian community that condemns one another for our sexual failures. What we need is a Christian community that will uphold one another since we struggle together for sexual purity in a world that says, do what you like. And this is a good point to remind ourselves this letter is addressed to Christians. Paul's not lecturing pagan Thessalonians or Sydney siders for that matter about their sexual immorality and I'd suggest nor should we. After all, when it comes to sexual morality, unfortunately we Christians can hardly claim the moral high ground. Besides which, sexual immorality is not a believer's biggest problem. It's a problem, but it's not their biggest problem. The reason pagans behave like pagans is because, verse 5, they don't know God. What a disaster that is. So instead of a Christian community presuming to condemn pagans, what they need is a community modelling godly sexuality so well that we make plausible God's wisdom for sex and human relationships. And so the issue at stake in this passage is not whether pagans behave like pagans. Paul writes these verses urging Christians to behave like Christians. It's God's will that you should be sanctified leading distinctively Jesus-shaped lives in how we behave sexually, in the way we love other people and in the way we conduct ourselves in the workplace. So that, verse 12, your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. That's a big ask. So may God's Spirit do His work in us. And may we respond with willing obedience that our faith in Jesus would produce a life pleasing to God more and more as the day of Jesus approaches. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the priest Sure.
Well, Sam Chan is an evangelist with Sydney's City Bible Forum. He's a public speaker, he's a medical doctor, and he's an author of several leading books, including Evangelism in a Skeptical World, and more recently, How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy. Sam was kind enough to give us some of his time. Oh, good day, Sam. Thanks so much for joining us here at Dural Anglican. Uh, good to be here virtually online. It's like science fiction, isn't it? Like we <laughs> dreamed of a day when we could do this and now it's really happening. Uh, here we are. Virtual uh, time travel. <laughs> I hope it's as good as or you space imagine. Space travel. <laughs> Yeah. Um, look, I, I want to begin, Sam, before we get to your book, which we'll come to in a moment, I wonder if you could share with us uh, just quickly how it was that you became convinced that Jesus needed to be Lord in your life. Yeah, sure. So for me, I grew up with parents who believed in Jesus and people often think, oh, okay, that's why you're a Christian. You know, right. you grew up in a Christian family. But I flip around and say, well, actually, that would have made it more likely that I wouldn't be a Christian. <laughs> so especially as an Asian immigrant Aussie kid, you're struggling with issues of identity. Who am I? I want to own who I am. I don't want to just inherit worldviews from my parents. I, I, so there's this struggle where you're trying to do everything you can be not to be like your Asian parents. <laughs> and so it, I think it made me work all the harder to work out, is this really true? Right. Was Jesus really the son of God? And I think there are key moments in my life. One key moment was when I was in high school, our, 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 our chaplain got us reading through the book of Romans systematically. Right. And I think for the first time I understood how the whole gospel, Jesus dying for you and a cross thing work, and that it meant Jesus is perfect. So you don't have to pretend to be perfect anymore. And for a high achieving Asian immigrant, that was really good news. And I think I finally understood that. I think I still had the idea that I was saved by good works up until that moment. Right. Another key moment was when I had to choose to decide whether to stay in full time medicine as a doctor or go into full time Christian ministry. And, of course, you can serve God as a doctor, and my dad does this, my brother does this. But for me, I had to choose, like, I had a public speaking ministry, and you can't do the two at the same time. Like, boy, you know, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Because if he didn't, uh, I am not giving up medicine yeah. to, to go and <laughs> preach and teach his stuff. So I think yeah. that really got me in this uh, thing where I had to check out the scriptures, search the evidence, and come to the conclusion, is this the explanation of best fit? Because that's how we form most of our beliefs. And finally, the third thing would be just early this year, my mother died in the month of May, suddenly, unexpectedly. So it was very sad, very tragic. I got to speak at the funeral. We had an open coffin. So I got to see the body of my mother. Right. And I had to say, you know, is, this is my mother. It's her body but it's not mum, like, mm -hmm. where is she? Mm -hmm. Like, there's something missing. It's her, we can call it her life, her spirit, her soul. And I just say, you know, well, are we more than the sum of our parts? And really, yeah. we only have to have two choices. One, life, spirit, soul is an illusion. It's a mm -hmm. story we tell ourselves, but really, we're just atoms and molecules. Uh, it, it, events just happen. There's no rhythm. There's no rhyme. There's no purpose. Or do I go for the second choice? There's a loving, powerful God behind this universe. That's why there's such a thing as life, yeah. spirit, soul, identity, because we have a personal God that we worship. And more than that, we all believe that the universe came from nothing. Life came from non-life. So how did all this happen? Did it come from a non-living universe? Or is there a living God behind this? And if there is, then if this God once made something come from nothing, life come from non-life, reason come from atoms and molecules mm. and a story, well, then I can trust this God that there will be a future resurrection because he can bring life again where there is no life. He's done it before. And if, if so, then I can easily believe in Jesus, the resurrection and a future resurrection as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Sam. That 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 kind of reassurance of our loving Heavenly Father who cares for you, um, Sam. I, I'm really grateful that you shared that with us. Thank you, because that gives us some context for some of the questions I'm about to ask. Um, um, in, in your in your recent book, How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy, you, you use the word evangelism. Um, when I use that word, it strikes fear into some people. Um, they they might think of skills, they might think of techniques. Um, but you describe evangelism as a way of life that's founded on building genuine friendships. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and you're so right. Up until now, if we got trained in evangelism and went to a Bible college, we got taught either how to, how to, we got taught either how to give a 20-minute monologue Bible talk at a church-run event as the Christian speaker yeah. Or we got taught how to do walk-up evangelism to a stranger. Yeah, and there's a time and place for both those things. But what do we do this in this space in the middle? Mm. How do I tell my friends and family about Jesus? People mm. that I had to see every day for the next 5, 10, 50 years. Yeah. I, and I, I'm not the one who can give them a 20-minute monologue. I can't treat them like a stranger. And so it's more than a technique or method. It really is a lifestyle choice. Just like how do I get fit? Well, it's more yeah. than a 20-minute run that you shoehorn into your busy life. It's more than just a diet that won't last more than a month. Just like fitness is a lifestyle change, evangelism is actually a lifestyle change where we just ask ourselves, well, how can I be Jesus to, to my friends and many other questions like that? Yeah, yeah. And, and one of the things that, that stood out to me, Sam, was the, the value that you place on hospitality in particular of making space in our lives to fit other people in. Um, as people who want our unbelieving friends to come to know and love Jesus for themselves, can you tell us what makes hospitality so powerful? That's right. We always think, how do I tell my friends about Jesus? I say, just relax, break it down into simple <laughs> steps. How can I have a coffee with my friend? How can I have a meal with my friend? How can I do hospitality with my friend? Yeah. How can I look for creative ways to be hospitable? Because hospitality creates the, the space and the permission to have deeper conversations yeah. besides yeah. the weather, the weekend, and the sport. So it gives us social capital, yeah. and it gives us permission. And you think about it, all of Jesus conversations like deep conversations usually mm. happen around food and hospitality yeah. Yeah. and somehow so and as we all know from hospitality it's never about the food in the end it's about the company and the conversation yeah. and that's what hospitality does it gives us permission and space to have those deeper conversations yeah and and, and related to that you you say and i think i'm quoting you rightly if an unbelieving friend invites us to one of their things we should make that our top priority. What makes their invitation so important, Sam? Yeah, I simply put it, if we go to their things, sooner or later that they will come to our things. Yeah. But it also means we, we treasure the friendship, mm -hmm. we value who they are just in and of themselves, and we're excited by the things that yeah. excite them, and we have a genuine curiosity in their life. Yeah. And as I argue in the book, as Christians, we often compartmentalize our universes. We have a non-Christian universe and a yeah. Christian universe. I say, one, we should merge these universes, but mm. also by going to their things, they will, you know, not only does it build social capital, but they will actually have more than just one Christian in their life. My yes. wife and I, uh, every, every year I MC the trivia night at the local public school <laughs> And like usually 100 and 200 people turn up. It's mm. a great time. But every time we go there, I've noticed we are the only Christian believers yeah. in a room for 100 yeah. parents, even though I know, mm. you know, the, 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 church, uh, the, the school itself is quite mixed in terms of believers and non-believers. But somehow it's a Friday night, it's a Saturday night, and Christians are either thinking, you know, I've got a church thing to go to or yeah. this is where I could spend time with my family. And I say, well, also, on, and those things are important, but also this is a time where I can invest in relationships with my non-believing friends. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you say that because one of the things, Sam, and I, and I think I'm right in saying this, we, we sometimes 
um, think of Christians living in bubbles. I, I don't know any unbelievers because I spend all my time with Christians. But you point out, I think it was the, the New York Times, um, you use them as an example of their publishing group as unbelievers who themselves hang out only with unbelievers. And as you rightly put it, when, when you make a friendship like that, you might be the only Christian contacts they have. That's right. So, again, it's not just the Christians who stay in their bubble. The non-believers stay in their bubble. Mm. And as I argue in the book, one of the reasons why our non-believing friends don't believe in the gospel isn't just because they haven't heard the gospel, mm. but also they have no Christian friends in their yeah. universe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Sam, one really helpful um, section in your book that, that I look to, to the friends watching on here at Jewel Anglican, I reckon this chapter alone is worth the price of admission. Um, you, you talk about becoming the de facto chaplain in people's lives um, and how having taken the time to build the genuine friendship uh, um, over time, you say, while our secular friends might be firm in their unbelief, in a time of crisis, they'll look to us to speak to God on their behalf. Um, Sam, what did you mean by that? Oh, yeah, and so what, what I say is my chaplain friends and say, I'll say this happens all the time. They will minister to certain groups and there will always be a bubble of people who are anti-religious. They have no time for Christian mumbo-jumbo, <laughs> but in a time of crisis, they will say to the chaplain, please come mm. in, take a seat, close the door. Can you pray for me? Yeah. And it's the same for us. If we show genuine understanding, genuine curiosity, that we're safe space where people can be vulnerable mm. and share what's mm. deepest and most true and most scary to them, in a time of crisis, they will come to us and ask us to speak on behalf of God, maybe pray a prayer for them, maybe explain, bring meaning into this seemingly chaotic, hurtful event. Yeah. And this happens so often both to my friends and me. Let's say, for example, there, there's a death, there, there's a funeral. They would need the Christian friend to be the one who gives a homily, maybe prays the prayer, uh, and, and so they will reach out to us. Mm. Or maybe, well, this happens to me all the time at work. I, I, I ask people how, how, how their weekend was or how yeah. was their holiday and then I ask the, what I call the power of the second question. Yes. I say, how is it really? Yeah. And then they feel yeah. safe to share with me how it yeah. really went or mm. how their kids are really going at school or what's really bothering them or how they really did sleep last night. It was troubled, it was disturbed. And I say, oh, if it's okay, my wife, my kids, we pray every night for our friends. Can we pray for you tonight? Mm -hmm. And they, they will say, yes, please, could you? Thank you. Then I check in on them next week, say, hey, we prayed for you. How is it going? And often God answers these prayers miraculously. I know yeah. this shakes yeah. my conservative, safe Chinese Christian <laughs> theology, but I think God goes out on a limb to show yeah. that yeah. he really is the supernatural God behind the universe. Yeah. And I will actually say to them, it's a miracle, and, and see where that goes from there. And yeah. now I actually get my non-believing friends coming to me and saying, can you, can you please pray? Can you pray yeah. for me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, being, as you described, that, uh, that calm, non-anxious presence. Well, one thing that, that I, I noticed, though, Sam, which you mentioned, um, all of those things that you've just described, those uh, genuine friendships, I, I think you, you go as far as to say that that can take, you know, two or three years to, to generate. And so we're talking about a long-term project of friendship here, aren't we? Yeah, so again, it's a lifestyle change. We really are, yeah, saying this is a journey, this is a lifestyle change. I think that the day when Billy Graham could come and give a 20-minute Bible <laughs> talk and yeah. ask people to believe, he was asking people to believe what they've heard 100 times before. Yeah. They'd already heard in youth group in Sunday school, but our friends have never heard it before. So we are just one of many series of moments in their journey to belief. There's a very gifted evangelist in Melbourne. She's called Julianne Laird. She, mm. she, her thesis is that it, it takes nine years for a non-believer from when they first hear the gospel to when they believe it. So she, wow. every year, she prays for a certain non-believing friend and say, this is the person I'm going to wow. reach out to. And every year she has a new person that she reaches out to. Yeah. And, usually, and, and then so she's always 
reaping a, a Christian friend that she once evangelized maybe nine years ago, but it wow. really is a long journey. Wow. And, and that's encouraging for us there. Yeah. And rather than seeing that as, oh my gosh, it's too hard, we realize, no, 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 no. Um, um, I'm not expecting this person probably in, in the mercy of God. I hope they do become yeah, a Christian the sure. first time I share the gospel with them, but really it's going to take many times of sharing the gospel with them. Yeah. And I don't know if it's this book or the other book I share that when I was a junior doctor, they told us that stomach ulcers were caused by an acid imbalance in your stomach. That's what we were taught in the eighties and nineties. Mm. And then there's this Australian doctor called Barry Marshall mm. From Western Australia said, no, it's caused by bacteria. Yeah. Give them an antibiotic. And I think it took him 10 or 20 years to convince the yeah. medical scientific community who are evidence-based uh, that and in the face of evidence for 20 years, it, it took 20 years for the medical community to realize he's right. Stomach ulcers yeah. are caused by bacteria and not yeah. acid. And so yeah. now we treat ulcers very differently from how we did when I was a junior doctor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sam, I, I, um, I can't recommend your book highly enough, How to Talk About Jesus Without Being That Guy. Um, to the people watching on at Durial Anglicans, uh, Sam's book, along with Steve McAlpine's Being the Bad Guys, these are two of your must-read books for 2021. Um, and here's a challenge. Buy a copy for yourself. Buy a copy for your friend as well and, and send it on because, as I say, I can't recommend these highly enough. Sam Chan, I want to thank you for spending some time with us here in Dural. Oh, Dougal, thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Dural Anglican, for having me. All the best, Sam. My name's Mark Sutherland-Harris. I go to the 8 o'clock service normally. Um, I'm also the parish treasurer. And um, before I lead you in prayer th this morning, um, I'd just like to emphasize a message we have in the bulletin. When we started not coming to church, I suggested that you save up your cash offertories, if that's the way you give, uh, and then give them when we resume. As it's taking much longer than expected, you might want to, and it's getting uncomfortable under the mattress, you might want to take them along to Westpac and um, bank them in the, in the parish uh, account. The details are in the bulletin. Thank you. Let me open our prayer time with the prayer for today. Lord of all power and might, the author and giver of all good things, graft in our hearts the love of your name, increase in us true religion, nourish us with all goodness, and so by your mercy keep us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Lord God and our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the scientific marvel of vaccines which have been invented so quickly and saved so many lives. We pray that everyone in Australia who can access a vaccination will do so as quickly as possible. I pray also that the world will be spared another lethal other lethal variants of the virus in the coming months and that richer countries like Australia will help their poorer neighbours to be protected before much more harm is done. We who are fully vaccinated and relatively safe, let us not forget in our prayers those who have suffered unduly from the pandemic, including our school children who have been robbed of two years of learning at school and growing up with their friends. The patients in nursing homes who are lonely and isolated from their families. The families grieving the loss of loved ones who have died of the virus, often with only nursing staff to comfort them. The people of all ages who suffer long-term effects from the disease and all those who work in the healthcare system, often under great personal stress and a great potential risk to themselves. There are so many people here and overseas 
who are being prevented from being re reunited with their families. But let us pray at this time particularly for the Snowden family, who have made the difficult decision to come home from Spain, but who can't get a flight. Please have mercy on them. Open the door for them without further delay and let them begin another fruitful chapter of their lives in your service. We pray this morning for Sai Hood of our 10 a.m. congregation who heads up our link mission missionary organization Logos Door, which prepares and distributes children's ministry material all, all around the world. Give him inspiration in finding effective ways to bring the gospel to children. And uphold his family, Penny and their children, Sammy and Josh. Let us not forget the people of Afghanistan as they face the uncertainties of life under Taliban rule. Please protect those being targeted in reprisals and allow the more moderate leaders to take political control. I also ask you to stabilize the economy to prevent it condemning the people to poverty, chaos and lawlessness. And let us pray for those known to us personally who are in sorrow need, sickness, or any other trouble. Within our parish, let me name those listed in the weekly bulletin. Gloria Wright, Anthony Booth, Steve Hembry, Francis and Melinda King, Jan Rickson, Phyllis Joss, Margaret Duckworth, Kath Wims, Shepard Vilkins, Jill Martin, Beverly Bell, Susie Powers, Joan Hoyle, Cedric Gibbs, Christy Norman, and Xavier. And now let's bring this prayer time to conclusion by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The weekly bulletin declares that we are all ministers. <clears throat> with that in mind, let me presume to finish with the following prayer from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode of Dural Anglican Online. We're going to finish by praying. Heavenly Father, we've heard your word today, so would you give us grace to receive it, faith to believe it, and the will to obey it. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Look forward to seeing you next week.